Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 to 8. And this can be found on page 8 in the New Testament portion of your Pew Bible. Reading from Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 2. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. <clears throat> and just then, some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human beings. This is the word of the Lord. Advent has been a special time for me here at the church this year. It's always a special time in the life of the church, don't get me wrong, but with everything that's been happening, with everything that we're going through as a faith family, it's been a special privilege to be able to share worship with you in this way. This journey that we've been on through this season that we call Advent was actually inspired as I was reading and comparing the Christmas stories in Matthew and Luke with the office staff. Two verses stuck out to me as we were spending time together focusing on how all the changes that were happening around us in the life of the church were going to boil down when push came to shove. Matthew 1.23 reminds us that Jesus is fulfillment of prophecy. He is Emmanuel, Matthew says, which in Hebrew means God is with us. Luke, on the other hand, encourages us that nothing shall be impossible with God. Matthew and Luke come at the Christmas story from wildly different perspectives. Matthew sees Jesus as the culmination of everything that God has done in history up to this point. Luke, on the other hand, sees Jesus as the brand new thing that God is doing in the world. And the irony is that they're both right. Jesus is both the beginning and the end of God's work in the world. God is with us, and with God, nothing shall be impossible. Four weeks ago, we started this journey through the season of Advent by remembering that the end of the story has already been written. Then we looked at the fact, at the special relationship that Jesus had with children and how he said that anyone who welcomes a child welcomes me. So we let the children tell us the Christmas story and why Christmas is important. Last week, we explored the truth that God inhabits the praises of his people and looked at the unique ways that God is with us when we work, gather for worship. And today, as we begin our conclusion, let's pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our God, our rock, and our salvation. For it's in you that we pray and in you that we trust. From this day forward and always. Amen. I hope that this morning I can tackle one of the great cultural questions of our age. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? <laughs> I mean, it's been said that there are two types of people in the world, those who think it is and those who are wrong. <laughs> but think about it. Here's a story of a man who's been cut off from the people he loves the most, who, to do that, travels as far as he can go from New York to Los Angeles and sets aside all the privileges and comforts of his position to find himself crawling through the dirt and dust of Nakatomi Plaza, only in the end to walk barefoot across broken glass. All of this to prove to everyone watching the lengths he will go to bring his family home. Sometimes the best Christmas stories don't sound anything like the Christmas story. 
We're used to the story sounding a certain way. We're used to Linus' recita- Linus's recitation in Elizabethan English. We're used to our own traditions and our own ways of being. But Christmas is at its core about a different way of seeing the world. Christmas is the story of royalty sleeping outside. It's of divinity in the womb of an unwed, unwed mother. It's of glory wrapped in strips of cloth. Christmas is God attended to by livestock and hired hands. These are the elements that make up the Christmas story, but it is a story of broken expectations, of upended traditions, and of a reversed status quo. This summer, Beth and I had the privilege of seeing a mostly complete solar eclipse. We stood in line on a hot summer day in Chicago with 100,000 other people be one of the first to get into the Adler Planetarium and receive special eclipse viewing glasses. To do this, though, meant getting up early, catching the right train downtown, making the right bus connection, walking, and then waiting in line to walk again for hours on end until the eclipse began. But when I held that pair of glasses in my hand, it all felt worth it. Until dozens of latecomers showed up with nothing but a well-rested look on their faces and simple pieces of cardboard with two pinholes marked in each, one for each eye. Turns out that by obscuring their vision, they were actually able to see. My prayer for us this morning is that by obscuring our own vision, by turning our attention away from Bethlehem and angels and shepherds and magi, this morning we might actually be able to see them more clearly. Because to my mind, there's actually no passage of scripture, no holy text, no story that better encapsulates everything that makes Christmas Christmas than this morning's scripture reading. Because it's here, 30 odd years removed from Bethlehem's manger, that God finally reveals why Christmas happened. Now the story is familiar enough if you've ever been in church A man who's been paralyzed for his entire life is laid at Jesus' feet by friends who, at least according to Mark's reading, are so determined to get him there that they dig through the mud and the straw of the roof over Jesus' head and lower him in through the roof. Jesus tells the man to pick up his mat and walk. And he does. Cue the astonishment. It's a familiar story, but I want to suggest this morning that on its own it's actually fairly unremarkable. First century Palestine was filled with traveling showmen who made a living curing physical ailments the same way Peter Popoff and Benny Hinn do today. Most of Jesus' healing stories get lumped into sweeping generalizations. Read the Gospels for yourselves and you'll find verses like Mark 6, 55, which says, Wherever he went, they laid their sick and begged that he might heal them, and they were healed. Or John 21, 25, right at the end of John's Gospel. There were many other things that Jesus did. There are actually relatively few stories of healings recorded in the Gospels, at least in detail. So, so when Matthew and Mark and John all recall the same story independently, this indicates that there is something more at play here than just a simple healing story. This, it turns out, is a story with implications for the entire Gospel. Because this is a healing with a purpose. Jesus says, this is done, and what he's about to do is so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This passage is about Jesus unmistakably revealing who he is to every single person in that room today and to every single person who reads that story down through the ages. Because he claims who he is and then he proves who he is. He proves that this is not just some man, some teacher, some healer, some charlatan. This is Emmanuel. This is God with us. Because the easiest thing for Jesus to do would have been to simply say to the man, your sins are forgiven. Even if that wasn't true, the easiest thing for him to do would have been to say it. Because we offer that the same hope all the time in our own, in our own language, except for us it sounds like, I'll pray for you. Let me pray for that. When tragedy strikes somewhere in the world, we hashtag praying. On social media, we send our thoughts to every single bad 
a bad event that, we, that comes across our Facebook feed. And it's never more prevalent than it is at Christmas time. But according to a 2016 study of Canadians, people who say that they're going to pray for something actually only pray for it 20% of the time. I'll pray for you. The words come out of our mouth so fast it feels like our brain is on autopilot. And so maybe we need to give the Pharisees their due. Maybe they were right to be concerned. Maybe it is blasphemy to tell someone that we're going to pray for them and not do it. Maybe it is blasphemy to say, your sins are forgiven, God loves you. So I don't want to make light of their concerns, but what they fail to realize is that the person standing in front of them is not you or me or any of the other billions of people who have lived since then. This is the man who has never been like anyone else and who no one else will ever be like. This is God with us. This is is Emmanuel. See, if our greatest need in life had been information, Emmanuel would have sent us an Emmanuel would Emmanuel would have been an educator. If our greatest need in life had been technology, Emmanuel would have been a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, Emmanuel an economist. If our greatest need ple- was pleasure, Emmanuel an, an entertainer. But because our greatest need was forgiveness, Emmanuel is a savior. This is the Christmas message. This is the message that the truth, that the church proclaims week in and week out. This is what defines us and what calls us together. That God is still with us because we still need saving. The work that God had begun when he offered hope that an offspring of Eve would crush the head of the serpent was realized in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Realized, but not yet complete. That's why every year we preface Christmas with Advent because God's work in the world, our mission is still ongoing. God is still arriving. And so Christmas reveals to us this simple and this great truth that we are the man on the mat. That none of us has brought ourselves to this moment, to this place. None of us has earned our spot at Jesus' feet. None of us has earned incarnation. None of us has summoned Emmanuel here. But God is with us nevertheless. And so that calls for a moment. A moment to be grateful for the people who made it possible for you to be here. Those who carried you here so you could hear the good news that shall be for all the people. Those who dug, spent time digging and clawing through the hard stuff of life with you. The straw and clay that circumstances puts in our path so that you might glimpse the Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so when you take that moment, remember that the story doesn't end there, though. That the best part is yet to come. But so that you may know, Jesus says, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins He says to the paralytic, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man stood up, picked up his mat, and went. This morning's reading proves what the Christmas story itself proves. That mission and incarnation cannot be separated. That as the church seeks to be missional, the church must also practice being incarnational. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, writes Eugene Peterson. We exist for the people who aren't here today. When Jesus told that man to get up and walk, he wasn't simply offering him the opportunity to to participate or be the recipient of a miracle. He wasn't offering him a a place in history as the man Jesus healed. He was calling and challenging that man to step into a whole new reality. One which he doesn't know yet. One in which he is grossly unprepared for, but one in which he has been made whole. He is calling this man to step for the first time in his life into the work of God's people, into the life and into the mission of the church. The church. This physical embodiment of cosmic reality, this, this grouping of people that we call a faith family, is the presence of God with us. 
God with us is us. Emmanuel in the here and now, chosen, called, and crafted for the singular purpose of revealing to our neighborhood that God is still here and still in the business of calling people to pick up your mat and walk. Still in the business of setting people free. Not just spiritually as though the church were some mystic society and not just physically as though the church were a social club. Not either or, but both and. And that perhaps is the great miracle of this passage. The tension in which it lives. Why this passage when so many others don't stands the test of time. Because in it, God reveals to us that we are both the man on the mat and the one who says, pick up your mat and walk. We are both recipients of grace and proclaimers of it. We are Emmanuel. God is with us. And with God, nothing shall be impossible. Thanks be to God. Amen. As the hands and feet of Christ, as the incarnation of God in the world, seeking to bring God's love and message of free grace to our neighborhood, We offer God our tithe and our offerings in support of the mission and the incarnation in the world. God's tithe and our offerings will now be received.